This is our last presentation in this series on who cares about Christian standards. Are Christian standards important? Yes. Extremely important. You know, they are basically um, not the principle, but they are related to the principle. So behind the standard, we always have to look for the principle, that, which is the core, which is the foundation of the standard. Uh, in our last study together, we are going to uh, look at the importance of standards, especially when it comes to the issue of jewelry, a very controversial subject in the Adventist Church, like the previous one on music, but I trust that um, our study together will uh, be biblical and uh, will be a blessing to those that are here and also to those who are watching our television channel, Some TV and those who are also watching the live stream. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne to thank you for your presence in this series. We thank you that now we are able to uh, study this very important subject. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us, open our understanding, give us the willingness to obey your voice, not because we have to, but because we realize that your way is always the best way. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. It has become fashionable in some circles of our own beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church to think that our lifestyle standards are too strict. You see, traditionally, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has upheld very high standards. For example, the church has frowned on drinking coffee, eating in restaurants on Sabbath, eating pork and other unclean meats, drinking wine with our meals, smoking tobacco, using drugs, going to the movie theater, listening to certain types of music, wearing jewelry, and marrying one who is not of our faith. Some, some people look at all these standards and they say, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has too many rules. It is too legalistic. Perhaps all of these things, all of these standards were all right in the 19th century when Ellen White lived. But in the 21st century, we've outgrown all of these standards. They were all right for the Puritans, but not for sophisticated people who live in the 21st century. So the question is, are these people who are critical of the standards and the rules and regulations that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has correct in their assessment? Well, what I want us to notice, first of all, is that God is all-knowing. There's nothing that God does not know. He is omniscient. And because God is omniscient, because God knows all things, He knows what is best for us. He knows what will strengthen our relationship with Him, and he knows what will weaken our relationship with him. So if he knows what will strengthen and weaken our relationship, and he presents certain standards so that we can have a strong relationship with the Lord, we might not understand all of the standards, but we trust God, because we know that God wants the best for us. Let me share with you some experiences that I had when I was growing up in Venezuela. My parents went uh, to Colombia when I was four, and then they moved to Venezuela when I was five, and I spent uh, from the year five to year 14 there in Venezuela. And um, I was not a model uh, child. I had my ups and downs, and I'd just like to share with you three downs in the context of what we're talking about. My parents had lots of rules and regulations in the house. And they repeated these rules and regulations on a regular basis. 
Of course, at my age, I thought that they were a little bit too picky, that they thought they knew everything. One of the things that they told me was, uh, you know, don't play with matches. And I said, I can handle matches. Why do they say I can't play with matches? Well, one day I was playing in the field behind the apartment complex that we lived in, and I was with a friend and we were playing like we were camping. It was a field that had lots of dry grass, tall dry, dry grass. And so we decided that we would build a little fire and act like we were camping. Well, it just so happens that uh, we lit the fire and suddenly the fire extended and started burning the whole field. Now right in back of the building where the, where the field was, there were a series of propane tanks. And uh, I praise the Lord that I'm not gonna give you some bad news about the propane tanks. The fire department was called and they were able to put out the fire before the fire reached the propane tanks. I hate to think what would have happened if the fire had reached those tanks. So I discovered rather rudely that my parents knew what they were talking about because they had greater experience than I did. But I didn't learn my lesson. My parents also told me, son, don't throw rocks. So I said, yeah, they think they know everything. So one day, I took a great big rock, I was at school, we were in recess, and I took the rock and I was playing like I was bowling. And I took the rock and I threw it on the ground and I didn't notice that one of the students was crossing in the path of the rock. It hit him in the ankle and broke his foot. And as a punishment, um, I had to go with my parents every day to his house to pick him up and take him to school because he couldn't take uh, the, the transport that, the, that the, um, was provided by the school. Uh, but that wasn't the only episode that I had. It just so happens that there was this cart that was drawn by horses that would come and he would park in front of our apartment complex and he had fruits and vegetables that he would sell to the people there in the complex. And uh, what would happen is when he finished selling, he would get into the, into the front of the cart, you know, he would sit there, he couldn't see what was going on in back, and he would get the horse to start moving, and I would go behind the cart to try and maybe grab an apple or grab something off the cart. Now I know that that's stealing, and uh, I knew back then that it was stealing. And my parents said, son, because they, they saw me do it, son, that's stealing. Besides, you can hurt yourself. And I thought to myself, oh, yeah, parents, you know, they think they know everything. Well, it just so happens that one day the cart took off, the horse took off, and the cart with it. And as I was running behind the cart, I stumbled. And I wasn't able to put my... I wasn't able to put my hands down on the ground. And I hit directly with my face on the ground. And I broke my front tooth. And to this day, I have a cap on that tooth, reminding me that our parents know best. Well, the same is true of God. If God has standards and rules and regulations, we might not necessarily understand all the whys and wherefores, but because God knows all things, God knows what's best for us, we should simply trust the revelation that God imparts to us. You see, my parents did not establish these rules for me because they wanted to, me to be unhappy and miserable and in bondage. They knew that throwing rocks was dangerous, that playing with fire was dangerous, and that running behind a cart might cause a problem. You see, God's standards are basically the same. They are an expression of God's love for us. God does not ask us to do anything or not do anything simply because He says so, but because He knows that it's for our own good. After all, God has been around a lot longer than us. 
He knows a lot more, and we should simply trust what He says. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 24, we find God speaking about why He has given statutes, rules, standards, regulations, and His law. It says in Deuteronomy 6 verse 24, God is speaking to Israel, And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as it is this day. So God's statutes, God's standards and rules are meant for our good, even though sometimes we, we might not think so. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we find these words, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. And why? For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Also Proverbs chapter 4 and verses 20 through 22 expresses the same principle that God gives us statutes and laws and regulations and rules and uh, standards always for our good. Anything that He reveals in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy is for our good. It says in Proverbs chapter 4 verses 20 to 22, My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, do not let them depart from your eyes, keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. In all of these verses God is telling us that what He reveals to us is for our benefit, it is for our good, that we might have peace, that we might have health, and that we might have long life. Let me give you some examples from secular society about the importance of rules and regulations and standards. Let's take first of all an automobile owner's manual. Is it legalism to follow the instructions that we find in the owner's manual of an auto? Is it legalism to follow the standards that the manual provides for the kind of oil that we need to put in the car, the amount of tire pressure that we have to have in our tires, and what kind of transmission fluid we should put in? Those are rules and regulations. Are those for our good, or are those a restriction of our freedom? Well, the fact is that the manufacturer knows better than we do what's good for the car. The instructions are given so that our automobile will function to the utmost, and we won't have to take it to the mechanic to get it fixed real frequently. So the owner's manual is not a restriction, it is a blessing. Let's talk about a traffic light. Why do we stop at a traffic light? You know, that's a regulation, it's a rule. We stop when the light is red. Why do we even obey traffic signals? Why don't we drive when we are under the influence? Are these laws simply nitpicking by the government? Legalistic nonsense? You know that, it, that they're not. The purpose is to preserve our lives and the lives of others. Now, when you come to a stoplight, you can look at that stoplight in two ways. When you come to the stoplight, you can say, Oh, bummer, I missed the stoplight, and I'm in a hurry. And you start talking negatively about the stoplight. The other way that you can look at the stoplight is, even though you're in a hurry, you stop at the stoplight and you say, that stoplight is there for my good. It's so that I don't have a crash and get killed myself and kill somebody else. So it all depends how you look at the rule or the regulation or the standard, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. Now what about health laws? Why has God given us certain health laws? Because they exist to guarantee our good. Why does God tell us that we're supposed to breathe fresh air, and we're supposed to 
only partake of vegetarian cuisine, and that we're supposed to get enough sleep, and we're supposed to drink enough water. You know, all of those are rules and regulations. We can violate them, but if we violate them, we live less long, we have less health, and we suffer more. So the rules and regulations of health are a blessing. God gives them to us for our good. And so all of God's standards and rules and regulations are given for our good. They are not given to restrict our freedom and liberty, they are given to guarantee a happy, healthy, holy, and prosperous life. Let me talk for a few moments about the standards of marriage. You know, when my wife's birthday comes around, I give my wife a birthday card along with some money in the birthday card. When it's our anniversary, I give my wife an anniversary present. And every so often to give her a break from the kitchen, I take her out to eat at a restaurant. What does she do? She's an at-home mom. She takes care of the house. When it's Mother's Day, I give her a present. I never run around with other women other than my wife. I've been married for 47 years, believe it or not. I'm kind of revealing my age a little bit. You see, these are all things that are expected, aren't they? You're expected to treat your wife this way. And your wife is also expected to treat her husband with respect. Now you can look at these things in two ways. I don't even think twice about giving my wife a gift for Mother's Day. And it's not because I say, well, you know, if I don't follow that rule or regulation what's expected, my wife is going to make me sleep in the garage. I don't look at that, uh, at that marriage what expectation in that way. You know, I don't look at, at the idea that, you know, I'm supposed to uh, keep myself only to her and say, oh, you know, there's this rule that I have to keep myself only to my wife. I'd love to go out with other women, but I better obey the rule. No. You see, when I love my wife, it's very easy to follow the rules and regulations and the standards that are expected in marriage. Are you following me or not? So it all depends how you look at it. If you look at it as a rule or as a regulation, it'll be negative. But if you look at it as a guarantee of happiness and peace and joy, then the standards become positive. Now we want to talk this afternoon in our final presentation about one particular standard of the church. We could talk about many others. We could, for example, talk about um, coffee drinking. You know, uh, it's become very fashionable for Adventists to drink coffee. And uh, you know, when you tell them you should drink coffee, they say, oh, I don't see anything wrong with it. It used to be that uh, Adventists did not drink coffee. So what I say is that perhaps coffee has gone through a conversion experience. And coffee was bad, but coffee's okay now. It doesn't have caffeine, and it doesn't damage, damage your nervous, nervous system now. Does it still cause the same effect as it did 40 years ago? Yeah. Of course it does. Who's changed? Not the coffee, us. You know, it used to be 50 years ago that you would go to an Adventist church and you knew that it was a Seventh-day Adventist church by looking at the women in the church. There was no jewelry whatsoever. But now it's become fashionable for women to come into the church, and some churches more than others, uh, decked out to the hilt. So what is it that has changed? Well, jewelry has changed. You see, jewelry is less expensive now, it looks nicer, so now we can use jewelry. What has changed? The jewelry? No, what has changed is us. The standards of God have not changed. What has changed is us. Now we're going to talk about the issue of artificial adornment in the next few minutes. I want to invite you to go with me to Genesis chapter 6, and we are going to deal with a passage that first addresses the issue of artificial adornment. You say, now wait a minute, where is that text? I'd like to see it. Well. It's in the passage that I mentioned, Genesis chapter 6. 
and you're not going to see it immediately. You're going to say, Genesis 6 talks about artificial adornment? Yes, it does. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. So here we have the sons of God, they see that the daughters of men are beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And now notice what the result is, the very next verse. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. And then in verse 4 we're told, there were giants on the earth in those days. That is, when the sons of God and the daughters of men existed. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Now what I want you to notice here in verse 4 is that there were giants before the sons of God entered to the daughters of men, and also after. So the giants were not the product of the sons of God linking up with the daughters of men, because there were giants before the sons of God went into the daughters of men. Are you with me or not? That's a very, very important detail. So it says in verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. This is the identical expression that's used in Genesis 11 about the builders of the Tower of Babel, only there it's translated, let us make ourselves a name. Very interesting, the rebellious Babel builders are referred to with the same term as these giants that are the result of the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men, and that also existed before that. Now what is the result? Verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Is there any connection between the sons of God going into the daughters of men, and having these giants as a result, and the giants existed before as I mentioned, and the wickedness of the earth. Absolutely, because immediately after mentioning that the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children, these were the men that wanted to be famous, they wanted a name, just like at the Tower of Babel, were told immediately afterwards that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, the degeneration of the world was due in great part to the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men. Now you're, you're saying, Pastor Bohr, who are the sons of God, and who are the daughters of men that are mentioned here in Genesis chapter 6? Let me share first of you, first of all, the view that is held by many Bible commentators, non-Adventist commentators. A common view in the commentators, as well as in some modern Bible versions, is that the sons of God were fallen angels, angels that left their abode in heaven. And they came down to this earth, and they saw these beautiful human women on the earth and they decided to have sexual relations with the human women. And they produced a, a species of mighty hybrids, which are called the giants. Now let me read you some Bible translations that have this concept. First of all, the NIV, which is the New International Version, and the English Standard Version, the ESV, translates the word giants as Nephilim. That is the giants that came from the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men, they were the Nephilim, that's the Hebrew word. In the contemporary English version, 
the giants are spoken of as children of the supernatural beings. See, there's the idea clearly coming to view that uh, they were actually a hybrid, they were the result of the union of supernatural beings with human women. The Young's literal translation translates the fallen ones, and the Living Bible translates evil beings from the spirit world. Now uh, obviously these are interpretations, they are not actually translations. So what I want us to notice so far is that the common view among many non-Adventist scholars is that the sons of God were angels, these angels came down to the earth, they saw these beautiful human women, they linked up with them, they had children, and the children were these that we've mentioned, the children were these hybrid, part human and part supernatural being, and those were the giants that Genesis mentions. Now what we want to ask is the question, who are the sons of God, and who are the daughters of men? We cannot depend on translations or on tradition. We have to allow the Bible to tell us who the sons of God were and who the daughters of men were. The first thing that will help us is the context. In Genesis chapter 4 we have the genealogy of Cain. Was Cain righteous or wicked? Cain was wicked. So we have the genealogy of Cain, and in that genealogy there are three women mentioned. These are the daughters of men, and it won't take time to get into the names of these women. The names emphasize external characteristics. And so you have in Genesis 4 the genealogy of Cain, that's the genealogy of the wicked. Then in Genesis chapter 5 you have the genealogy of Seth, who is the line of the righteous. And then at the beginning of chapter 6, the very beginning of the next chapter, it says that the sons of God came in to the daughters of men. So contextually, who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men? The sons of God are those who belong to the lineage of Seth, the line of the righteous. Whereas the daughters of men are the women that are mentioned in the genealogy of Cain, the genealogy of the wicked. In other words, the sons of God are the righteous, whereas the daughters of men are the wicked. I like the way Martin Luther interpreted uh, the sons of God and the daughters of men. He didn't go along with many of the modern interpretations. Martin Luther wrote, the true meaning of the passage is that Moses designates as sons of God those people who had the promise of the blessed seed, that is the righteous who would bring the seed, Jesus Christ, into the world. Ellen White concurred. I read one statement from volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 93. She wrote, Unhallowed marriages, that is marriages that God did not bless, of the sons of God with the daughters of men resulted in apostasy which ended in the destruction of the world by a flood. Did you notice in Genesis chapter 6 immediately after speaking about the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men, it says the wickedness on the earth was great and that therefore God sent the flood? Ellen White is simply amplifying that concept. She's saying unhallowed marriages of the sons of God with the daughters of men resulted in apostasy which ended in the destruction of the world by a flood. Now you say, but Pastor Boer, she's not explaining here this, who the sons of God and the daughters of men are. We need to read another statement of hers where she clearly identifies the sons of God and the daughters of men. Signs of the Times, February 20, 1879. Seth was of more noble stature than Cain or Abel, and resembled Adam more than did any of his other sons. The descendants of Seth separated themselves from the wicked descendants of Cain. They cherished the knowledge of God's will, 
while the ungodly race of Cain had no respect for God and His sacred commandments. So notice that she's talking about the descendants of Seth and the descendants of Cain. And then she writes, But when men multiplied upon the earth, she's quoting Genesis 6, When men multiplied upon the earth, the children of Seth saw that the daughters of the descendants of Cain were very beautiful. And they departed from God, and displeased Him by taking wives as they chose of the idolatrous race of Cain. So who were the sons of God? They were the individuals in the holy line of Seth. Who were the daughters of men? The women in the genealogy of Cain. In other words, you have two groups, the sons of God, the righteous, and the daughters of men, the wicked women from the lineage of Cain. Now I know what perhaps some of you are thinking. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor Bohr, doesn't the book of Job identify the sons of God as angels? Yes, it does. We're told in Job 38 verse 7 that the sons of God at creation sang and the stars of heaven shouted for joy. Obviously they're angels. In Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. The, these are the highest angels that represents the worlds, that represent the worlds in the universe. So you say, if sons of God in the book of Job are angels, why do you say in Genesis that they are the lineage of the righteous? Very simple. Because terms in the Bible don't always mean the same thing in every context. If I was to ask you what a lion represents in Scripture, what would you say? Can a lion represent Christ? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Can a lion represent Satan? He goes about as a roaring lion. Can a lion represent the kingdom of Babylon? Yes. Can a lion represent Judah, the son of Jacob? Read Genesis 49. So when you find the word lion, it doesn't always mean the same thing. So just because in Genesis, the sons of God represent the righteous, doesn't mean that in Job the sons of God are the righteous. What does leaven represent in Scripture? Whenever we set, talk of leaven, say, oh, it represents sin. Not always. Jesus gave the parable of the leaven. He spoke about putting leaven in, in, leaven in the dough and the dough would grow. The dough represents the church and the leaven is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in the church, the church grows. So leaven does not always mean sin. In the Bible, the sword represents the Bible. But the sword in Romans 13 represents the, what is given to the civil power to keep the civil order. So what I'm saying is that just because in the book of Job, sons of God is angels, does not mean that in Genesis the sons of God are angels. This is the mistake that modern versions and commentators make. They simply say, because in Job they're angels, in Genesis they have to be angels as well. Incidentally, the Bible tells us that those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord are sons of God. Notice Romans 4, 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. How many, of he, how many here are sons and daughters of God? Raise your hand. Are you sons? You don't look like angels to me. <laughs> But you've been converted, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. So the expression sons of God applies to believers. So in Genesis 6, the sons of God were the believers. Now you probably are still wondering about the giants. That's not particularly the subject that we're looking at, but let me say something about the giants. The giants cannot be a hybrid, half angel and half human. You say, why not? Because as I mentioned, Genesis 6 tells us very clearly that there were giants after the sons of God entered to the daughters of men, but there were also giants before. So they are not the product of the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men. Second, the word Nephilim, which is translated giants, is used only in one other place in the Bible. And that's in Numbers 13, verse 33. It's speaking about the giants that lived in the Promised Land when Israel was about to enter the Promised Land. There were giants there. Those could not be the same giants that existed before the flood. 
because the flood destroyed them all. Are you with me or not? And of course those who were in the land of Canaan, they were not half angel and half human hybrids. Number three, Jesus explicitly said in Luke 20, 34 and 35, that angels do not marry, nor are they given in marriage. Period. So these angels, supposed angels from heaven, could not come and have sexual relations with human women because, very clearly, uh, these were uh, not angels. So what does the word giants mean? The, giant, the word giants means that they were gigantic in size, they were gigantic in intellect, they were gigantic in length of life, and also gigantic in evil. Now it's interesting that Jewish tradition also teaches, the, the Jewish Talmud for example, teaches that the sons of God were angels. And that's where the commentators and the Bible versions get that idea today, besides the expression sons of God, they go to the Jewish writings, the ancient Jewish writings, where the Jews said that the sons of God were angels and the daughters of men were human women. We know that that's not true because of the points that we've covered. However, there is something about Jewish tradition with regards to the sons of God and the daughters of men which is trustworthy. And you say, what is it? I want to read two statements from Jewish tradition. Did you notice in Genesis chapter 6 that it says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful? In other words, the daughters of men had something that appealed to what? To the sight of the converted sons of God. Do you think there were also daughters of God? Do you think there were daughters of God? Of course, if there were sons of God, there were daughters of God. Why didn't the sons of God look at the daughters of God? Because the daughters of God must have looked different than the daughters of men. Are you with me or not? Jewish tradition understood the reason why. The sons of God, even though there were daughters of God, they said, oh, not the daughters of God, we'll cho choose the daughters of men. Let me read you two statements that come from Jewish tradition. The first is from the Targum of Reuben, chapter 5 and verses 5 through 7. Flee therefore, here God is speaking, flee therefore fornication, my children, and command your wives and your daughters that they adorn not their heads and faces to deceive the mind. Because every woman who uses these wiles hath been reserved for eternal punishment, for thus they allured the watches, watchers who were before the flood. Now they're wrong about the, about the daughters of men alluring the watchers, the watchers were angels, they're wrong about that. But notice that Jewish tradition is right about what allured the sons of God to the daughters of men. It says, they adorn not their heads and faces to deceive the mind, because every woman who uses these wiles has been reserved for eternal punishment. The second statement comes, actually I'm going to read three of them, the second one comes from the Targum of Pseudo Jonathan, Jonathan, chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. This one is even more explicit. And it came to pass, when the sons of men began to multiply in the face of the ground, and beautiful daughters were born to them, that the sons of the great ones saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, with eyes painted and hair curled, walking in nakedness of flesh. And they conceived lustful thoughts, and they took them wives of all they chose. Isn't that interesting? What did the sons of God see in the daughters of men that they did not see in the daughters of God? The daughters of God were ordinary. Their faces were not painted. They were not all adorned. And the sons of God said, all these women, these daughters of God, they are so simple. Oh, but the daughters of men, look, they're beautiful. But it was artificial beauty. Here's another statement from the book of Enoch. It's an apocryphal book. 
but it shows us the beliefs of the Jews in the century or two centuries immediately before the coming of Christ. It's speaking about Azazel. We know who Azazel is, right? He's a symbol of Satan. Notice the statement. Aza this is, from, this is a, from the book of Enoch, but it's a comment that comes from the Jewish encyclopedia. Azazel is represented in the book of Enoch as the leader of the rebellious giants in the time preceding the flood. He taught men the art of warfare, of making swords, knives, shields, and coats of mail. He taught women the art of deception by ornamenting the body, dyeing the hair, and painting the face and the eyebrows, and also revealed to the people the secrets of witchcraft and corrupted their manners, leading them into wickedness and impurity. Until at last he was, at the Lord's command, bound hand and foot by the archangel Raphael and chained to the rough and jagged rocks of Dudael, where he is to abide in under to utter darkness until the great day of judgment, when he will be cast into the fire to be consumed forever. Isn't that an interesting statement? Once again, he taught women the art of deception by ornamenting the body, dyeing the hair, and painting the face and eyebrows. That's the way in which the sons of God were deceived by the daughters of men. Now, this statement says that the, that the sons of God were the angels, but by what we studied, they're not angels. They're really the individuals who were faithful to God, those who were converted to God. In other words, what Genesis is saying is that the sons of God, who at first remained separate from the daughters of men, they began to come down into the valleys. And they said, oh, the women that we left at home, they are so ordinary. Oh, but look at these women. They're real killers. And that's literally speaking, by the way. The sons of God took the initiative. They were the ones who chose among the daughters of men, and they were the ones that came in to the daughters of men. Not, out, not only do we find in Genesis this problem at the very beginning, but also the New Testament makes it very clear as to what women should not wear and use. And what uh, many, uh, even Seventh-day Adventists say is, well, this counsel by Peter and Paul is culturally influenced. It doesn't apply to us today because that was the culture back then. But we have a culture that allows these things now. You know, you can convert everything in the Bible into a cultural thing. That's been done, for example, with the issue of women's ordination. We have what it says, husband and one wife. No, no, that was a cultural thing. That was a patriarchal society. We're not in a patriarchal society anyway, anymore today. We are free from this, what God has established. And so, you know, there's this process of, of explaining everything away, saying that it was cultural. Let's notice what the Apostle Paul and Peter had to say. Let's read, first of all, from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It was a problem in those days as well, later on in history. Here Peter wrote, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. What, what should uh, women win their uh, unbelieving husbands by? By all of the trappings? No, no, by their conduct. Verse 2, when they observe, when the, these unbelieving husbands observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely, and this is really sorry what the New King James Version does. It adds the word merely. To give the impression that, you know, it's okay if you use the jewelry as long as you have the good conduct. But if you'll notice, the New King James Version has the word merely in italics, which means that it's added by the translators. 
It's not part of the original text. So really what it says in verse, two, uh, in verse 3, do not let your adornment be outward. And then it gives some examples. Arraying the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Notice what the Apostle Paul had to say. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. I'm reading from the NIV because the translation is clearer and it doesn't violate the text. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 8 through 10. I also want women to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds, appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Are you following me? Yes. Now, let's talk a little bit about Lucifer. Lucifer, according to Ezekiel chapter 28, was created very beautiful. Notice Ezekiel 28 and verse 17. It says there, Your heart was lifted up because of your what? Because of your beauty. By the way, have you read in Ezekiel chapter 28 that God decked Lucifer with all kinds of precious stones? You know, this is used to say, see, it's okay to use stuff with precious stones because God put it on Lucifer. Yeah, he put them on Lucifer, but it was in a, in a perfect heavenly world. Not only that, but, but he, the beauty of Lucifer led him to look at himself. So you can't use uh, the fact that God gave Lucifer in a sinless heaven, he covered him with jewels, as it says in Ezekiel 28, and use that in a sinful world, because if Lucifer couldn't handle it up there, what hope is there for us? Are you with me? Amen. Now what a contrast with Jesus. Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3. Jesus comes to this world, and notice the description that's given of Jesus. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. Speaking about Jesus, he has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Was Jesus beautiful? Was he beautiful? Was he physically beautiful? Was he more attractive than any man in the world at that time? Was he taller than all men? No. Where was his beauty? Inside, in his character. And it shone out in his conduct or in his actions. Continue saying here, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now if Jesus had come garbed as a king, with all the luxury of a king and the crown of a king, they would have been impressed. But because the beauty of Jesus was inside and was revealed in his conduct, they said, this individual doesn't deserve a second look. It continues saying, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. And yet he was the most beautiful being in the universe, which could be seen by his conduct, not by his exterior appearance. Ellen White in Gospel Workers, page 49, wrote this, The world's Redeemer did not come with outward, outward display, or a show of worldly wisdom. Men could not see, beneath the guise of humanity, the glory of the Son of God. So they, they couldn't see beyond what was before their eyes. They couldn't see the beauty inside. She continues, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was to them as a root out of dry ground, with no form or comeliness that they should desire Him. Let me mention just for a moment the sanctuary in the wilderness. What was the sanctuary made of? What, what did people see when they looked at the sanctuary? It was actually made out of seal skins. 
What color is seal skins? They're like a, like a coffee color, dark brown. Really attractive color, right? No, ordinary. But let me ask you, what was inside the sanctuary? Oh, the beauty was inside the sanctuary, not outside. And what did the sanctuary represent? The sanctuary represented Jesus. The tabernacle represented Christ. Just like Christ, outside there was no beauty that would be desired, but His beauty was inside, so the tabernacle outside was ordinary, but inside it was filled with beauty. You see, that's the principle that the Bible is presenting when it comes to this particular Christian standard. And that is that we should not be attractive because of all of the trimmings that we put on ourselves. The gold and the silver, the precious stones, the fancy hairdos, and the expensive clothing. No, what recommends us to God is the beauty of our character. Yeah. Notice what Ellen White wrote in Bible Training School, May 1, 1908. Christians are not I don't know how people can, can uh, disobey this so openly. Well, I do know, because they don't believe Ellen White was a prophet. Perhaps that's where the real problem is, that we don't trust the spirit of prophecy anymore. But we will read uh, Rick Warren and all these secular authors. Notice, Christians are not to decorate the person with costly array or expensive ornaments. All this display imparts no value to the character. The Lord desires every converted person to put away the idea that dressing as worldlings dress will give value to his influence. The ornamentation of the person with jewels and luxurious things is a species of idolatry. This needless display reveals a love for those things which are supposed to place a value upon the person. It gives evidence to the world of a heart destitute of the inward adornment. Expensive dress and adornments of jewelry give an incorrect representation of the truth that should always be represented as of the highest value. An overdressed, outwardly adorned person bears the sign of inward poverty. A lack of spirituality is revealed. Is that clear? Crystal clear? And by the way, these days you have to apply this to men too. Because men, you know, they fill their bodies with tattoos as if they think that that looks beautiful. I cannot understand how they would even do that. My perspective is that all those tattoos just look ugly. They disfigure the human body. And you know, they wear earrings, they put rings through their nose, and you know, they put these great big rings that expand their ears. Not only women. This principle also applies to men. Anything that attracts attention of others to us instead of to God is unacceptable for the Christian. And we need to examine our own hearts, and we need to be honest with ourselves why we do these things when they are strictly forbidden in Scripture and in the spirit of prophecy. Let me read two statements in closing from the spirit of prophecy. I read one of these, actually I've read these, both of these statements in previous presentations, but they bear repeating again. The first one is from Review and Herald, August 12, 1884. The work of the enemy is not abrupt. It is not sudden and startling. It is a secret undermining of the strongholds of principle. It commences in small things. The neglect to be true to God and to rely upon Him wholly, the disposition to concede to the demands of the world for the sake of gaining numbers on the church book. Excuse me, what, was, what does that say? Once again, let me read, it commences in small things, to, to the neglect to be true to God and to rely upon Him wholly, the disposition to consent, concede to the demands of the world for the sake of gaining numbers on the church book. In other words, just baptize them with all their jewelry and eventually they'll take it off. Never happens. We need to teach people what it means to follow Jesus before they're baptized. Amen. 
They need to make a total commitment to Jesus and become a disciple of Jesus before they're baptized, not after. Now let's go to the second statement, volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 573 and 574. I read this one in our presentation last evening. Men of principle need not the restriction of locks and keys. They do not need to be watched and guarded. In other words, the pastor doesn't have to come and say, Sister, what are you doing with those earrings on? Brother, what are you doing in this, in this restaurant on the Sabbath? No, no, no. Not necessary. When the heart is converted, those things will take care of themselves. You don't need lock and key. She continues, Men of principle need not the restrictions of locks and keys. They do not need to be watched and guarded. They will deal truly and honorably at all times, alone with no eye upon them, as well as in public. They will not bring a stain upon their souls for a moment of gain or selfish advantage. They scorn a mean act. Although no one else might know it, they would know it themselves, and this would destroy their self-respect. Those who are not conscientious and faithful in little things would not be reformed were their laws and restrictions and penalties upon the point. What a powerful statement. That's a good statement to end our series with. It reminds me of the three young men in the valley of Dura and Daniel in the lion's den. These men lived faithfully in the small things. And therefore when the big trials came, they remained firm to their principles, firm to God's standards. And they said, if I have to die to be faithful to God, be it so. Because they had the hope of the resurrection according to Hebrews chapter 11. You can read it there, where you have a reminiscing by Paul of the experience of the three young men and of Daniel. So folks, I would pray to God that we would have Jesus Christ in our hearts, and because of that we will live in harmony with the standards, not because we have to, but because we love to. Because we love the Savior, we're converted, we've been changed, and we seek to give honor and glory only to God. Bye.